Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Joan, and, and this is Rachel Peregrine, and we're both uh, partners in Raptology. And we've been fortunate to do programs for you at the library, but now with COVID, that isn't happening anymore. And so actually, we're going to kind of take advantage of that to give you a vaccine tour of, of Raptology. Um, because we don't do on-site programs, this gives you a chance to see how we keep the birds, how we feed the birds, that normally is not open to the public. So I'm standing here outside of uh, some of our mews here at Raptology headquarters. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our birds first today. So behind me, um, she's kind of tucked away in her little house inside, but behind me is Reggie Great Horned Owl. Um, Reggie is named for the Raptor Education Group Incorporated, where she came from um, after her rehab, uh, her stint in rehab. Reggie came to Raptology as a young owl. She fell out of her nest um, as a very, very young owl. Um, she bled internally. That was healed, but by the time she had gone through treatment, she was um, what's referred to as human imprinted. So that means that she was raised by humans, um, which I do want to note is illegal if you do not have the proper permits and licenses to do so. Um, she, um, it just means that she's too used to being around humans and she doesn't quite have the, the knowledge to be a wild owl that she would need to live out in the wild. So she's about, she's eight years old. Um, like I said, you can't really see her in there right now. She's hiding, but that's kind of what owls do. Um, she values her privacy, so um, we can move along and give her her privacy. <laughs> right here behind me is Sky Red-Tailed Hawk. Uh, Red-Tailed Hawks are one of the most commonly seen raptors in Iowa and the Midwest and all of the U.S. actually. Um, Sky is 11 years old. She's our oldest bird. Um, she is with us because she has, uh, she incurred a broken wing um, before she um, became part of our group. Um, it didn't heal quite properly enough for her to be released into the wild. Um, so just to be on the safe side, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DNR um, deemed her what is called non-releasable, which means that she cannot be released back into the wild due to her injury. Um, she um, she gets around well. She's bouncing around behind me in there. She likes to um, she likes to be part of the group. So I think that's kind of what she's telling us right now. <laughs> All right. So I am now standing outside of Magic Merlin's Mew. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see, but he's in there flying all around. He's like a little ping pong ball. Um, Magic is um, a merlin. It's a, a species of falcon. He's a very small falcon. And he came to us um, two years ago, just over two years ago. Um, we're not entirely sure how old he is. He might be about three or four. Um, merlins don't live in Iowa usually, so he may have been migrating through when he um, incurred a wing injury. He does have a wing injury. Um, he did not heal properly, so he could not be released back to the wild again, similar to Reggie Owl. Um, but he, um, he has a lot of energy and he's very cute. Um, so we like to remind folks too that because he is very small, sometimes it's hard to remember that he is a predator, um, but he's got a big attitude and so he likes to remind us of that whenever he can. So behind me now is uh, Sarah Screech Owl's Mew. Um, she is all tucked away in her little house back there, so we really can't see her right now. Um, trust me, she's very cute. Um, Sarah is an Eastern Screech Owl. That's a species of owl that you will um, find here year round. You probably won't see one because they're very tiny. Um, you'd be far more likely to hear one than you would be to see one. Um, Sarah Screech Owl is an imprint. Um, she fell out of her nest as a baby, um, did not incur any serious injuries, but by the time she'd gone through rehab, um, she, she was too used to being around humans. And so um, she came to us here at Raptology. She's been with us now for three years, I believe. Um, she's about three years old. Um, so we got her when she was fairly young. Um, but she's always a crowd favorite because she's so cute. And again, she is very small, but she is a predator. So we like to remind folks of that too when they see just how cute she is. So I'm here with my buddy Gonzo Vulture. Um, Gonzo is a turkey vulture who you probably saw around here all summer long. Um, 
Gonzo is, um, he's about five years old. Um, he is a human imprint. So like several of the other birds here, that just means that um, he doesn't have the knowledge to live in the wild. Um, we don't think that he had any injuries, but someone found him as a young vulture and picked him up um, and took him to a um, wildlife rehab facility. So um, vultures are very smart. Um, Gonzo loves attention. Um, vultures are very social in the wild. Um, and because Gonzo is human imprinted, he, he doesn't quite know that he's a vulture. Um, he kind of thinks that he's a person. We're his flock. So whenever we do a program with him, um, he loves the attention, he loves the crowd, um, and he loves beef heart treats, which I'm gonna give him right now. That's his favorite. So he's being so good, he gets a treat. Good job, buddy. <laughs> so we're gonna talk now um, about, um, well, Gonzo Vulture's favorite thing to talk about, which is food. Um, all of the birds here are raptors, of course. Um, they only eat meat. Um, we like to ask kids sometimes at programs, would they want ice cream? Would they want pizza? Nope, they want all the meat. Um, so the birds get a, a pretty varied diet. Some of what they eat includes um, quail, uh, gopher, mice, rats, things like that. Those are what raptors really like to eat. And that's what most mimics their diet in, um, in nature. Um, excuse us. Um, <laughs> Um, so we, um, we do remove the intestinal tract from the food when we feed and we do that just to cut down on any, um, any potential for contamination, um, bacteria, things like that. Um, we get donations from some folks of um, quail, or not quail, um, gopher and um, rats, the quail and mice we buy. Um, the birds all get fed once a day. Um, they don't do three meals a day like humans do. They might like that, but they really only need to eat about once a day. Um, in nature, that would most mimic their, um, their natural diet. Um, when it gets really cold in the winter time, sometimes we um, increase the amount of food they get so they can get more calories and more energy. Um, in nature, a lot of times when it gets really cold, um, raptors will choose to not eat simply because going out and hunting for their food um, costs more energy than it does for them to just kind of sit and maybe digest what they had yesterday. Um, we keep all of our food here in a freezer downstairs. Um, there's a designated human food freezer and there's a designated bird food freezer so um, they don't get mixed up. I don't think you probably would mix that up but just in case. Um, we do provide water for them um, they get water um, all the time except for winter. We pull their water bowls in the winter time just simply because it would freeze and not really be worth um, having around. Um, they drink the water, but they also sometimes will jump in and splash around in it. So um, they get a lot of the moisture that they need from the food that they eat, um, the blood and other um, fluids that just occur naturally in their food. Um, helps to keep them hydrated, but we provide water just, um, you know, they need that too. So um, we clean the food um, out of the muse every day. Star talked about that. Um, so Gonzo here, uh, all the other birds eat, um, well, in nature, they would hunt live prey, but Gonzo here, vultures and other carrion birds, they are scavengers, so they only want what's already dead. Um, I'm gonna give him, I've got treats in my pocket here. Gonzo loves beef heart. That is his very, very favorite. And so when we give him treats, I kind of tuck it in my hand like this, because if he was eating in nature, he would be sticking his head into some pretty gross places and some, some pretty dead animals. And so this is kind of the closest that we can get to mimicking that. So, hey buddy, be cool. Good job. Good job. The be cool thing is something that I uh, started training him with recently and he caught on so quickly. Um, I have him tuck his wings and hold still. So, um, but he gets a treat now anyway, just cause he's being good. This is everybody's dinner tonight. So this is Gonzo Vulture's dinner. He's getting a nice rat. Uh, we are getting 
Sarah Owl is going to get some quail. That's what's here. And the powder on top is just some um, vitamins and supplements for them. And then this is Rachel Peregrine Falcon's meal. She's also getting quail. And then you can see Sky is getting mice and a little bit of quail too all mixed in. And quail for magic and mice for Reggie. All to mimic their natural diet. You know, they would generally be getting rodents and different small birds to eat in their diets. And that's really all there is to it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about housing for birds. Um, these are called mews, M-E-W-S, and that's where we keep the birds. You have to be really careful when you build a mew. All our birds are permitted by U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Iowa DNR. And before we can even think of getting a new bird, we have to build a mew, send them pictures, draw them dimensions, just like we were an architect, and make sure that they feel that that mew is adequate for that bird. Um, so we have to consider how to keep the birds safe and how to keep the birds um, comfortable in all different kinds of weather. We don't have any electricity in this part of the yard, and so we can't provide heaters for these birds. So when we build the mew, we have to consider both summer temperatures and winter temperatures and safety. So all of these mews are built partly with slats to get air in, and partly with surfaces that are solid, because we always want the birds to be able to get out of the bad weather if they need to. Um, the owls both have little shelter boxes that they can hide in. Um, and the birds will mostly stay out of the weather, um, but sometimes I come out and it's raining and the birds are sitting out where they're getting wet because they like it. All of these mews are screened and the screening is because in the summer we can have mosquitoes. Mosquitoes transmit West Nile virus, and that is sometimes fatal to birds. And also, as you probably remember, the lovely gnats or black flies that we get in the spring. They make life very uncomfortable for us, and they make life horrible for the birds. In the wild, sometimes the young birds die because the gnats bite them so much that the birds lose so much blood that they become anemic. The adult birds can just pick up and fly off, but the young birds have to be in the nest. And another thing that happens sometimes, and I know has happened with the Decora eagles, is that the birds are so bothered by the gnats that they jump out of the nest prematurely before they're fledged. And then either somebody has to find them and care for them, or sometimes the parents will actually feed them on the ground. So, Everything has slats and screen on it. And because you don't want anything to tunnel under, all of these, before we build them, we put a trench around them and we put hard wire, hardware cloth down about 18 inches so nothing can come underneath. Um, all of the muse have a double entry, double door entry. Think of it like an airlock. So we go in, we close the door behind us before we open the next door, and we do the same coming out. All of our birds are flighted. They are non-releasable, but they can fly some more distant than others. So we're very, very careful with that. Um, we have three birds, including this one, a peregrine, a merlin, um, and the vulture, who are migratory birds. These birds normally in winter would not be hanging out in Iowa. Um, the red-tailed hawk, the great horned owl, and the little screech owl are native here. And so we don't worry about them very much in the winter because their cousins are all out and about here. But these birds, although they'd probably be okay, we're a little more careful. So we put a roof over, we, um, on the three mews that they are in, that will have a roof that's already on for the winter. And then we will use some, like a corrugated hard plastic that we put up on the outside. It lets some air movement go in, but it breaks the, it breaks the wind. Um, and that's pretty much what we can do for them. Um, when we had that super cold spell a couple years ago, 
and it was 50 degrees wind chill and I was in Chicago and scared to death, Dawn and some other wonderful volunteers came over, put the birds in their travel crates, and those three birds spent the next couple days in the basement in their travel crates because that was just too cold. Sometimes in the summer when we get those days that are over 100 degrees, we come out, we check on the birds a lot, they do have the water, but again last year when it got really hot, birds moved into the basement and Gonzo moved into the laundry room on the first floor. He thought that was great. Um, so that's, that's the muse. The bottom of the muse has pea gravel, underneath it is sand, so we get good drainage. Um, the muse all have perches at different heights because we want the birds to be able to move around. They're not leashed once they're in the mew. And we want different surfaces on the perches because we want to keep their feet healthy and um, having a different kind of substrate on that keeps them from rubbing those feet all in one place. So we use coca mat, like on the welcome mat. We use artificial turf. We use regular wood. We use a variety of surfaces. Hi, I wanted to share with you about the cleanup that we do to behind the scenes with our raptors. We do twice a year, we go in and we do a major cleanup in each of the mews, which a mew is considered the house that each of the raptors live in. Uh, we go in twice a year and do a major clean, which might mean scrubbing the walls. Sometimes we paint, we might have to go in and put new perches up, which we just did a fall cleanup on that. And we will go in and put new roofs on and the siding for winter time. Uh, on a weekly basis, we have to go in and clean up a uh, major cleanup, which would be, the kids would laugh at on this. Uh, we have to clean up the poop along the way. And on a daily basis, we go in and we clean up any food that's left over because we can't leave that in there. They have to have fresh food every day. And we change their water. And the water is kept in their muse three times during three seasons. We pull the water out in the winter because we don't want them to have their feet wet during the winter time because they have leather jesses on. So we wouldn't want that to be wet during the winter. So we do that on a regular basis. And every day we go in and pull out any of the unused food portions. So that's pretty much what we do on a daily basis. And what I'm gonna do is kind of show you a little behind the scenes where I would go in on a daily basis and clean up what, what happens on a daily visit into the mew itself. This is a mew that we would come on into and I usually kind of walk in and assess what cleanup needs to be done. First thing I do is kind of look to see if there's any leftover food that they might have left from the night before. That gets gathered up right away into a trash bag. Pull out any old feathers that might be in here and try and keep it as clean as possible. This would be a Thursday for us where we usually do a very heavy cleanup on a Thursday. So we would come in and if you want to come on in behind me, we would assess to see what Rachel, this is our peregrine falcon, what she has left behind for us. And we have our floor is all pea gravel, which makes it really easy for us to clean up. We come in where she has gone and she has dropped her poop down here and we do a lot of scooping. It works real easy on the pea gravel and we just scoop and clean like that. She will also drop a lot of little feathers along the way. Those get scooped up on a, a daily basis, but mostly on Thursday and usually one other day during the week, we do a major cleanup like this. So, but by having the pea gravel here, it makes it really easy for the cleanup to happen. We will find that they will leave behind also from where they had their food. You'll find here, like here, they have a lot of little feathers that have to come out of here too. This time of the year, it's usually not real hard because it's cooler weather, so you don't have the bugs causing any problems. But you can see where we've got excess feathers that they've left from where they've eaten their food. And this is the food that they don't eat. So it's not real hard to do, but 
it will depend on the type of birds you have as to how their poop is. If you have, say, a hawk, they will spray their poop a little outward, where if they were in a nest, they would want it out of their nest. Where if you have an owl who is perching on a perch, he's going to drop it usually directly underneath his perch. So our cleanup is a little different as to which mew we would go into as to how our cleanup is actually done. So that makes a big difference too on our daily basis. So, so and you can see where each bird has been, where this would be more like in the hawk family, they spray their poop a little bit, a little bit more random around in the mew itself. So, so that's pretty much what's entailed in a cleanup. If this was summertime, spring or fall, we would have had water dishes and we would have had to change the water also in here in, that, in our daily changing. So that's pretty much how the cleanup goes. And we would do that to every mew in depth on a Thursday. And that's how it goes. <laughs>